a fun panel. Uh, this is, uh, and the name of the panel is Covering History Under the, the Dome, the State House as a Stage for Historic Events. Now, we have with us historians of some, or at least older journalists, who were here in those days. And <laughs> so I want to introduce, starting at my far left here, Chris Graff, who was a staff of the AP for many years. And he was uh, in the Bureau starting in 1978. He has watched uh, events in this building for uh, until 2006. He's written uh, books about Vermont. Uh, he was for years the host of Vermont This Week, and uh, he now has a very important job at National Life here in Montpelier. Um, Andy Page, sitting next to me, um, has been a reporter and editor for nearly 40 years. Um, she started at the, at the Providence, Rhode Island Journal, and she uh, came to Vermont and uh, uh, covered Vermont for the United Press International. Uh, she has been a, held many jobs at the Burlington Free Press, including managing editor. She was the editor of the editorial page. Um, she's now, uh, even though sh she's retired from the Free Press, she's working with Seven Days to help, in effect, train new and uh, upcoming journalists which is a great gift that they'll have from her. Howard Coffin is a person of many parts. Um, I think most of you know him now as Vermont's uh, preeminent Civil War historian. There is not a uh, Civil War battle in which Vermonters have been involved that Howard hasn't researched, talked about, written about, um, uh, and uh, helped lecture about throughout Vermont. But I first met Howard when he was a, a younger reporter, like myself, at the Rutland Herald. He was um, always, always digging for a story. And one of the things I used to marvel at when I was the managing editor, is that Howard would, uh, he figured out the system. So he would come to work at nine o'clock in the morning, maybe earlier, and by the time I arrived, by three in the afternoon, there would be a basket full of his, uh, his copy. And he, he was a very fast writer. I think at lunch we talked about, he may own the record, when he was once assigned to cover a Vermont Bar Association meeting in Montreal, and out of that, believe it or not, he uh, produced 14 stories. <laughs> so how accurate they all were, I'm sure they were, but uh, there was a lot of work. So I thought what we would do today is to give each of these folks an opportunity to talk to you about what it was, what they remember about reporting in this building and some of the events over the years that has remained with them. Candy? All right, Chris, you go. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's great timing to have the fossil panel at the end of the day. All the working journalists had to go back to work, and we can get done in time to go have the senior special at the wayside. So this is a, um, <clears throat> and what a span of people uh, on this panel. It's a great panel to have somebody who covered the Civil War as a journalist. <laughs> and me, I covered Civil Union, so it's quite a, a span. But I love the title. I don't know who came up with that, Tom or 
Steve or whoever, but the State House is a stage for historic events is a wonderful title. I just love it because this is a stage for the most historic events that have happened here in Vermont. Every major historical and political event in Vermont has played out here. Uh, whether it's responses to the Civil War, struggle over women's suffrage, debates about temperance or civil rights, taxes. Act 250 was born right here. Fights over our sales tax or the income tax. Um, reapportionment, which I'm sure Howard will probably talk a little more about. No, or Candy, um, but, or Steve. Uh, but reapportionment, which happened here in 1965, um, the 246 member house that it existed from the very beginning of time for Vermont was eliminated in what was called the suicide legislature and they made the current 150 member house. And M. Hebert, some of you may know, we all certainly remember well, he said that on that day Vermont ceased to be Vermont. And it was an incredibly emotional debate. All of that has happened here in the State House. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, transitions that have happened, and then maybe later, uh, if we come back, I'll talk about some of the sessions. Um, I want to say first that I walked into this building. Actually, what I want to say first is uh, it was 40 years ago this month that I joined the Associated Press, and my first assignment was competing against Candy Page. Uh, at the United Press International. It was a, a trial in Burlington of a West German terrorist, Christina Burster. And there is nothing in the lores of journalism like the competition between Associated Press and UPI. And it was an international story at the federal courthouse and it had all the national characters you could imagine, including William Kunstler. And uh, Candy and I competed every day, twice a day, for each news cycle, and she beat the crap out of me. It was unbelievable. It was baptism by fire, um, and I have tremendous respect for her. But I walked in here in 1967 as an eighth grader. I was 13. Phil Hoff was the governor. Uh, Dick Mallory was the speaker. And what I remember from that visit were the bathrooms downstairs. I had photos of this ornate men's bathroom that's downstairs. Some of you may or may not have visited. I won't ask you which ones have, uh, but the fixtures are brass. The um, marble is everywhere. And all of us eighth graders from Woodstock Elementary School, the boys, posed to have our pictures taken by the urinals. I learned later that it was built in 1884 and the legislators were tired of uh, tramping out to the outhouses back outside and there's nothing comparable for women because there was no need to then, no women were allowed at the State House. It took me many years after I came back here as a reporter to find that bathroom because it is in the basement and they only use it, I think David this is true, for school buses and things like that. Uh, uh, school trips and so we were down there but I always thought it was a figment of my imagination um, but it's what I remember from my first uh, visit to the State House. The two events I want to talk about um, are not about legislative sessions but the two most memorable events that I remember from being at the State House were transitions of governors and the first was the inauguration of Madeleine Cunin January 10th, 1985, in this room. It was the most historic event that I had witnessed, and the excitement and electricity in this room was really pretty amazing. Madeline Cunin swept into the room. She was dressed into white. There was a band over there that was playing Handel's water music. And people, the, the State House was full of people. Some, one woman had gotten on a bus in Detroit and come here just to witness the election, the inauguration of the first woman governor of Vermont. The other event that I want to just mention, because I just think um, it too was historic in that way, was the death of Richard Snelling um, in August 1991. It was the first time since 1870 
that the office of governor had changed parties outside of an election. It's actually, the, I'm sorry, first time ever. It was the first time that a governor had died in office since Governor Washburn in 1870. But it was the first time ever that the political party of a governor had changed office outside of an election. Because Howard Dean was a Democrat and he was the Lieutenant Governor. And so we had first the startling news that Dick Snelling was died and had died and many of us who knew him uh, well thought that could never happen, that he just could never die. The guy was invincible. Um, but two, we had in the course of that day the transition to a Democratic governor and we wondered all of those questions. Would he keep the cabinet? What would he do? Would he have the same policies? The final thing I just want to mention was about Dick Snelling. Um, and what I think was the most amazing event that I ever witnessed here outside of one, which is the debate over civil unions. And that was January of 1991. Ralph Wright was the speaker. Richard Snelling had just returned to the office of governor. And everyone thought these two colossal egos would just fight and battle to the end. And we as reporters were relishing that opportunity. And the office of the speaker back then had just been built to a new office and Ralph looked outside of his office first day of the legislative session and there sat Dick Snelling, the governor. And Ralph had all of his lieutenants in the office and he ran out and said to his secretary, why is the governor here? She said, oh, he just wants to have a word with you. And Ralph got his lieutenants out of there. And so began one of the unlike, most unlikely alliances in the history of Vermont. These two men sat together for a few minutes and they, Dick Snelling said to him, we must be better than what people expect from us. We have to work together and solve the state's fiscal problem. And the reason Dick Snelling had been reelected overwhelmingly um, in 1990 was the state was headed to a major fiscal crisis. And so Dick Snelling and Ralph Wright reached across the aisle and they agreed on a plan that raised $90 million in new taxes, balanced the budget, it put more taxes on the wealthy than Dick Snelling wanted, and it made more cuts in human services than Ralph Wright wanted. And the two agreed, and they stayed true to that. And it became really pretty remarkable, because when it came up to vote on the House, it was a tie vote, 72-72. And Ralph Wright, as Speaker, had to break the tie and vote for this package. When Dick Snelling died that August, over the next couple of years, people put a lot of pressure on him to change some of the elements of that package, but he refused because he said he had made a deal with Dick Snelling. And I think in these days where we don't see civility in our politics and we don't reach across the aisle, it's just wonderful to, imagine, to remember what happened and what still happens here today. Thank you. Let me just go a little bit of field for just a minute uh, and tell you a story that happened in 1967, the year I came here to the State House as a reporter, the year the Red Sox finally went to a World Series. Uh, I was assigned uh, in 67 suddenly to go to Mount Washington. Is it too loud back here? I was having trouble hearing out there, so I wanted to make sure you're hearing. Uh, how's this? Good. Jane, is that all right? Okay. 67, I was assigned suddenly to go to Mount Washington. The Cog Railway had wrecked. People had been killed. I arrived at Mount Washington the next morning, and most of the northern New England press corps was there. But the, the train company told us no reporters would be allowed to go to the site. But there was a train going up to bring down the wrecked engine but none of us could go. By late afternoon, it would be down and we could get pictures. Well, the train started up the track and I started running. And I dove onto the flat car, and just as it was picking up so much speed, they couldn't throw me off. And I got to the site and I got the first pictures and scooped the world and down I came in triumph. Why did I do that? A first year reporter, uh, you know, with those kinds of instincts. 
It was because I worked for the best journalist that ever made a career of journalism in Vermont, Kendall Wilde, the managing editor of the Rutland Herald. Jane, you worked for him, Steve. Uh, and I was here at the State House as a reporter, uh, and I'd been there a little bit uh, by the time that wreck happened, and I had come into the presence of the greatest reporter who ever covered these halls, Mavis Doyle. And I think today that when we covered the house in those days, we sat at this table. And Mavis Doyle sat at this table. And Mavis and Kendall taught me to be aggressive. That is the way to be a reporter. And also, you should have an adversarial relationship with government. That is what we were meant to do under the First Amendment. And democracy does not work without an aggressive press corps. Okay, well, let me just, I'll just speak about, and let me just speak about Mavis, if I may, for just a moment. Um, she was an, an incredible competitor. And uh, at that time, uh, the Free Press Capital the Bureau had three people, the Vermont Press Bureau had three people, the AP and the UPI had at least two or two and a half each uh, channel had a reporter. The WDEV had a person here every day in the legislature. So there was incredible competition. Um, but Mavis was in our own class. One day, um, there was a big controversy in the Department of Education, which is across the street in that marble building. And uh, Mavis somehow managed her story to get herself locked in the Department of Education um, after the normal office hours when nobody else was there and um, lo and behold she had a terrific scoop the next day that all of us never knew what the hell well, Steve, if I could just throw in quickly, there, there was a day when she was covering a meeting one of, the, of one of the legislative committees downstairs, and they went into executive session, which made us hated. In other words, they threw the press out. But, but they took a short break, and so Mavis put her, hid herself in the closet. <laughs> so she should listen to what was going on, at least. The problem was that Mavis was a smoker. And after about 15 minutes, she lit one up, and smoke came out the keyhole, <laughs> and they caught her. That's but she did that because she believed the people had a right to know, believe me. The real thing. <laughs> Let me just say, one of my memories is May 14, 1965. Howard alluded it, to it. It's the, or, or Chris did, it's when the House voted to reapportion itself. And this, this table was lengthwise, and this is where the press sat. They got moved later up in the balcony, years later. But um, it was a very emotional day. It was a, kind of an early spring, warm day. And um, I'll always uh, remember uh, the issue was to, the legislature was under a federal court order <coughs> It had to reapportion, and that meant, after much debate, that it, it would reduce its size from 246 members to 150. Uh, in the old days, Reedsboro had uh, 38 people, Burlington had 38,000, and each of those places had one representative in the legislature. So it was a little malapportioned. Um, but on the day of the vote, a gentleman from Stannard, Frank Hutchins, stood there, although they were, these seats weren't here then, they were the smaller seats. And, and as the vote was announced, and in those days, well, even now, you can sort of explain your vote. And when Frank Hutchins came to explain his vote. 
He was standing there and tears were streaming down his face. And he said, uh, basically, what really, it's really too bad that he, he basically evil forces come into this house and cause us to change. And then his last comment was, there will never be a representative from the town of Stannard. And you know, until two years ago, or maybe four years ago, he was right. In that large district, only one person, I think he's still a member, is uh, from the town of Stannard. So a very emotional day. Governor Hoff was up in that balcony, and the, excuse me, the moment the vote was announced, he let out a wild yahoo and left, and it was, um, anyway, it's still like it happened to me yesterday. Candy. Well, first I have to, um, I have to correct Steve. I actually started my newspaper career at the Free Press. I, oh. grew, I grew up in Vermont. Uh, uh -huh. I didn't come here. And I went to the Province Journal, then I came back. But I had, just to take a little bit of the, um, take off the rose-colored glasses about the Vermont legislature for a minute, I had been a reporter for a, literally about two and a half minutes when the Free Press sent me down here to help cover the concluding day or two of the legislature when you know, typically in the legislature, all, many of the most interesting and important bills pass at the last minute. And the two things that I remember about that experience was on my, my first assignment was to find out whether the Republicans in the Senate were going to have a caucus about some issue. And I went to a senior and very respected uh, senator who will remain nameless unless somebody asks me. Um, <laughs> and he looked me in the eye and told me that the Republicans were not going to caucus. And he then left the State House with his wife and I was terrified to go back and tell my editor that I hadn't gotten what I was supposed to get. So I followed him across the street where he was attending a caucus of the Senate Republicans. So my first experience of the legislature was you don't necessarily trust these very distinguished looking men. And then the next day, um, my assignment, this. I will never forget because it was my first front page byline. Um, someone, I can't remember who, in the anti-poverty movement had um, organized a demonstration of low-income people to bring their issues to the legislature. And they held a big rally outside on the State House steps. And then they came in and they wanted to attend an open caucus of the House Republicans, which is held downstairs. And the Speaker of the House was outraged for reasons I no longer remember or never understood, and got into, literally got into a physical shoving match with, um, with this group of anti-poverty people, and basically threw them out of the State House, and they had to go down the street and hold their meeting at a church. So I was very young, I was very naive, and you come and you sit, you know, as Howard said, we sat at a table that ran down the center of the well of the house, and there's this sonorous voice calling the roll of these impressive sounding names, and it's very easy as a young reporter to get captured by that sense of ritual and that this is Vermont and if you write about something that's wrong it will get fixed. But I, I sometimes worry that we pat ourselves on the back too much. On the other hand, when I went to Rhode Island, my first experience covering the Rhode Island State House was that I went to a, a committee hearing which uh, where they slammed the door in my face, which had never happened in Vermont. So. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say for a minute is 
Steve and, and uh, Howard both talked about Mavis Doyle, who really was a force of nature. She, she uh, was not a traditional reporter. She had a point of view, and her point of view quite often showed in her stories. But if you were competing against her, I never left the State House. When I got a regular assignment here, they did send me back. Um, I never left the State House at the end of the day without finding out what had happened in every committee. And there were, there were what, 12 or 13 House committees and 10 or 11 Senate committees, and you needed to know what each committee had done every day. And not only that, you were going to write about maybe a third or a half of them. I just say that to remind us all how times have changed. Uh, we probably wrote too much about the minutia. You know, a committee decided to amend a bill, we'd write about it then, we would write about it when it came to the floor on the first reading, second reading, then we'd write it about, again, about it again when it passed the House. And anyway, I'm sure we wrote more than people wanted to read, but there was a sense of, this, of the State House being close to Vermont and that people cared about even the relatively minor things that happened here. And these days, you won't ever read about most of the bills that pass the House and Senate. There are too many of them. And uh, journalists, I think, have concluded, newspaper publishers certainly have concluded, that the public isn't interested enough to give them a big diet of State House news. I, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. One, one point here, one point, uh, that our, the age the, when we were here as reporters has been called by some the golden age of journalism in Vermont, well, maybe, but let me say this about it. Uh, we were incredibly competitive and aggressive, but I think the legislature had some of its most productive years when the journalistic competition was like that. And as an example, I would cite the passage of the environmental laws. I think that the press made a great governor out of Dean Davis. And he was a great governor. But Davis and his Republican friends championed the environmental laws. And it was the pressure from the media, I think, that really drove Davis in that direction. The Rutland Herald, uh, as Act 250 came up, the big environmental bill, uh, assigned me uh, to do two week, a two-week long research project on conflicts of interest in the legislature, uh, land holdings, property holdings by members of the House and Senate, and I called almost all 180 of them. And then when the bill was up for consideration, I came to Montpelier on Ken Wiles' orders for two weeks to babysit Act 250 every time it was considered in committee and then on the floor to make sure it was not tampered with. I mean, that is, uh, that is advocacy journalism, uh, blatant advocacy journalism, but what would we have done without Act 250? Because Davis saw the sewer coming right out of the ground at the, the developments at Stratton Mountain and we are on the way downhill, and I think the media had an awful lot to do with virtually saving Vermont uh, in, in that period. So, one of the things, uh, uh, having Candy say the distinguished gentleman or whatever that she spoke to, um, I think that all of us would agree, and maybe each of us might have a story, that. Um, that the legislators were much more colorful in our days. Um, that the citizen legislature, I used to say, was the state's greatest asset and its greatest liability. Um, but uh, Tom Salmon, who became governor, uh, Tom Slayton actually, I think he almost published a book on uh, all the weird, funny things that Tom Salmon said. We, and we had a, a legislator who was like that, uh, Gilly Godnick, who you may know as the mayor of Rutland, but he um, was also a state senator. And, you know, he used to say things like, um, uh, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Um, <laughs> there's always one rotten egg in every bushel of apples. 
or you three make quite a pair. Um, and so whenever you had a quote you needed, you'd go find Gilly sitting holding court over there. But I, I suspect all of us can come up with the stub earls of the world. Um, you know, up until uh, stub earl who represented Eden, um, there was a spittoon uh, next to his desk. And he used it very often. Uh, and we had a lot of folks like that in, in the citizen legislature time. And when this house was created back at the beginning, um, it was seen as the common people's house. And that's why you had one representative from each town. It was incredibly undemocratic when you think of it as a population basis, but it meant that every town had a representative. And what you saw, the change that happened from reapportionment, it was the beginning of the end of the hold of the Republican Party on Vermont, because you had um, in the one town, one vote time, a very strong Republican and farmer uh, representatives. Um, by the way, and Steve might know more about this, but um, the, when there were 246 members, um, there was a, it used to be, and I think this is true, but if not, it will be taken as truth, um, that some towns would send up the folks that they had on welfare, which towns at the time were in charge of, they had the overseers of the poor, and that if they needed to, and so there was one part of the of this house chamber where um, the, it was called Sleepy Hollow, and uh, those folks, they got a meal, and they were here, and didn't make that much um, of a difference as legislators. But I think that in that time, we saw people um, who truly were representative of Vermont. And I think it's getting harder and harder for people to serve in this legislature. And you've seen a change in the composition since the time that we were covering the legislature. You're right. As you know, the, let me mention, there was a legislator from the town of Manchester, Reed Lefebvre. And he was a very large personality. He also ran a circus. And, and he was first elected here in 1947. And he brought to the well of this house one May day his uh, circus. And with trapezes. And, and it was a uh, rather uh, a, a great story for Life magazine. Years later, Reed Lefebvre, and it's about the time Chris was talking about, um, there was a bill before the legislature that members ought to have their pay docked for the days they were absent. And Reed uh, got up and said, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, you should know that, that some of our members make their greatest contribution on the days they are absent. <laughs> and, and uh, the bill was killed. <laughs> so, is there, um, um, Chris and Andy and Howard, is there, uh, as you look at the legislature now and look at the issues in Vermont now, and look at the different media and, and technology, is there uh, something you think is being missed? when they convene in this building? The, f the fun, the fun. Because the legislature didn't go home at night when we covered it. Most, a lot of them stayed over across the way at the tavern and uh, it was a party every night, was it not, Steve? And so we would go file our stories and then we'd head out to the parties because that's where you got the stories you began to get the stories for the next day because when they'd had a couple, they talked. And so it was a party every night and it was so much fun. And there was a camaraderie within the legislature, which I don't think is there today. And uh, I think they maybe functioned a little better at times because they were together so much. Of course, that could rub the other way uh, too. Uh, one more quick story it just came to my mind on Mavis Doyle. Uh, one of my best friends in all the world was House Speaker Walter L. Kennedy, Peanut Kennedy, 
and uh, public and speaker, and uh, we, we became close friends. You made friends here, even though you were tough on them. Uh, I called Peanut one day. He was the best source I ever had. Oh, I got stories on the Republican Party out of him. I called him one day. He had a dealership, a car dealership in Chelsea. And I said, uh, he answered, and he said, how are you, Howard? And I said, I'm all right. And he said, well, you're probably better off than I am. And I said, what's the matter, Peanut? And he said, well, I just sold Mavis Doyle a lemon, and it broke down up on Washington Heights. <laughs> So uh, one thing that I would mention, if you're asking that question, Steve, is um, um, <clears throat> it goes back to what I was saying about the citizen legislature being uh, the greatest asset and the greatest liability. Um, I don't think people really understand how limited our legislature is with staff, um, with assistance, um, and even with salary in some ways. Um, but I used to bring editors up here and give them tours of the State House, and they'd always say, well, where are the legislators' offices? <laughs> well, it's these desks here. They don't have offices. And I think one of the things that we have seen over time is it really, our legislature is afraid to invest in how they would appear if they start hiring staff um, to help them. But what it means is the power of the lobbyists continues to grow. And our lobbyists, we have a very vibrant lobbyist system in Vermont, which is probably a good thing because we have very strong lobbyists on sort of each side of an issue, and that provides help. But more and more, our legislators rely heavily on the lobbyists to write the language of the laws that they are enacting. And that's not a good thing. And I think that uh, from the time we were here, except for things like Act 250, the legislation used to be pretty simple stuff. And it got more and more complicated when you saw federalism and, and powers going to the state. And now our legislators are dealing with incredibly complex issues as much as our Congress. And yet they're pretty much on their own. And so I think that's the one thing that we still wrestle with as a state is, you know, how much can we handle a citizen legislature, what extent? We do not want a full-time legislature, that's clear. But legislators, are it's becoming harder and harder to serve, and it's becoming harder and harder to um, get the work done with the little staff that they have. I think that's right, uh, Chris. You know, I, I've often thought Vermont loves to be either first in the nation or last. And, and so when you want to be first, and there are new issues of technology, um, social issues, those get a real hearing in this the building. And there seems to be uh, a real effort, I would say in the last 25 years, uh, especially starting with the environment mental movement, Howard, to really try to be a, a leader on things. And until this year, we were kind of last in gun control, but now that's changed. Do you have any observations about how? Well, uh, not, uh, not really, but one of the things that struck me when Chris talked about lobbyists writing legislation, which they do. They draft legislation or language for legislation. What I remember about 1974, 1975, there were like three lobbyists. There were no lobbyists. There was that guy who represented the truckers, Jim Finneran. And I can't think of anybody else. So this, this was 150 people trying to figure it out without staff and without outside experts. And it's pretty amazing that they, I think uh, the governor's office provided a lot, of, a lot more of the substance of what became law. But even so, it's pretty amazing what they were able to do. Also, there were many more lawyers in the legislature at that time. Uh, and they filled in some of that, some of that gap. 
So, any of you have a Jim Finneran story, like taking uh, people to Montreal? With, um, those were the, um, in those days, uh, and I think it was the Herald that kind of broke that story with a photograph of uh, Finneran standing out beside a charted bus, legislators getting on the bus. He was handing them tickets to the Montreal hockey game, I think. Howard. It was to a Canadian's hockey game, right. and they were putting, uh, we had pictures, Tom Slayton took them. Right. Uh, right. We had, uh, I was, we were standing on the fire escape over at the tavern, and they had pictures of cases of Molson being loaded on the bus <laughs> by legislators. We had them cold. <laughs> so, uh, many things have, obviously the, the light of day of uh, the media has played a important role in this building. Um, but you know, Vermonters as a whole, and even we saw it in the poll that was released this week, and the question was asked this, which caught my eye. Uh, this was the VPR and the Vermont Public Television poll. How closely do you follow news about national and state politics? Would you say very closely, somewhat closely, not very much or not at all? Very closely, 35%. Somewhat closely, 36%. Not very much, 19, not at all, 8%. So that's quite a, I would say, evidence of an engaged Vermont uh, public. And I think it's still because even though our media has changed, as we heard earlier in Vermont, we have sort of reinvented other ways that Vermonters get news through technology and other means. But bottom line to me is, I think because of our, of our town meeting culture, most Vermonters I know are pretty interested in what's going on in their, in their state still. And I hope that continues. I think that's true in some ways. Um, when we choose a governor and the seat is open, we want to meet up those candidates and kick the tires and really see them up close. And I remember in 2002, I think Doug Racine and uh, Jim Douglas had 36 forums around the state. Um, and that's what we expect. But I do think, uh, I remember a story that Edgar May used to tell. Edgar May was Madeline Cunin's brother. He was a state rep and then a state senator from Windsor County. and. He used to say that he'd be walking the streets in August, and the legislature would have adjourned in April, and people would say, Senator, what are you doing home? People didn't know that the session was over. So I think that there's a way that people keep an eye on it, but they don't know the details of it um, at, at that level. Um, so, but I, I do think that the, the other thing is that in Vermont, being so small, that all politics really is local. and if, Something happens and people think of the state government as their local government, but they care that much about it. Um, and I think over the years, um, especially in the time when all these folks were in positions and, and, and the business of news was much better um, generating more revenue than it does today, Vermont had over-representation of news media covering the state house than any other state. There were surveys at the time, and no one competed with Vermont. You heard Steve at the beginning list some of the competition, and it only grew from there, um, where, uh, you know, you, you would go to any other news market, and legislative news would never show up on a TV station. And if you watch Channel 3 in a Peter Martin station, and Tim Lewis was here, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, le the Channel 3 cared about local news, had very advanced technology so they could broadcast live from here. And in other news markets, they wouldn't give a time of day to legislative hearings or legislative developments. And I think that's 
what really has always made a difference for Vermont and why you're seeing places like Seven Days or VT Digger and other places today trying to keep that news level up when other states are, are giving it up on politics and legislators. Sure, I think we've got 15 minutes and I'd love to get questions from the audience. Do we have questions? Yes. Um, uh, this is uh, great fun to hear you talk about the old days. Um, um, none of you happen to mention the role of women, and since there are a lot of women here, I, um, I'd be interested in your comments because, of course, um, today women hold uh, leadership roles and uh, as majority leader and this sort of thing, and committee chairs and and so on, but in the days you were talking about, no woman ever served on the um, Committee of Conference on the Appropriations Bill. Madeline was the first one, and the chairman of the committee um, started off with his cigar because smoking was allowed, saying, oh my, we've never had a lady here before, and, um, and comments um, like, You'll add to the scenery around here and, you know, things like that. So um, there were very few, if any, women in these positions. And um, so when do you think that changed? And what impact do you think it had on legislation? Well, I think uh, Madeline Tunin was clearly a turning point. She was the first woman to chair the House Appropriations Committee and then she was uh, our first woman governor and I would be hard-pressed, I'd be interested in what the other panelists think to say that the uh, more, more equal representation uh, of women has made a substantial difference in the kind of legislation you see. Uh, maybe on when it comes to an issue like guns, possible that uh, women are more likely to think about the safety of their kids, but I don't know that that's the case. It's wonderful to see uh, both, not only are the are two women the chair of the two appropriations committees now in the state house but they're sisters which i love um, we now have had two women speakers and i i don't see it as I, I look at it as something we don't really have to think about anymore the shame is that we've never managed to send a woman to washington when i came up here uh the women in the legislature who had any uh, in power were generally conservative Republicans. Madeline Harwood. Yeah. Uh, uh, but did she have power, would you say? Oh, yes. Wouldn't you say so, Steve? She was an influence and to a certain degree. By the way, uh, if you watch the legislature very long, I think one thing you learn is about 10 people run the legislature. Do you agree with that? It's, 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 a, str it's a strange way it works, but that's about right. Uh, and the, and uh, uh, Margaret Hammond, uh, who came from the town of Baltimore, Vermont, that's in Windsor County, uh, she was a very conservative uh, Republican, a, a dear person. Uh, but I think one of the people who began to change that was a senator uh, from Washington County, uh, Dorothy Shea, Dottie Shea, who really had influence in the Senate. And uh, she was... Uh, very good on labor issues. Mavis was a great uh, fan of hers. As I recall it, uh, uh, the civil union was very strongly supported by women legislators. So um, I, I think that uh, we would all agree that um, up until a certain point, uh, the legislature, both the House and the Senate, were old boys network operations. Everything here was. Um, and I do think that there were some women standout legislators, but I think we began to see the change uh, 
uh, um, statewide when Madeline was governor because she put a lot of uh, women into her cabinet um, who some she pulled from the legislature like Gretchen Morris and others um, who were then given in very important prominent positions and you began to see more of a change but um, it really the bigger story here is that I think we've lost sight of how um, recent it really is in our time how this has become a democratic body. This was a very conservative Republican legislature. Um, you know, when um, when uh, Tim Tim O'Connor was elected speaker in um, '75, uh, he was a Democrat, the first Democrat elected speaker. The Republicans still had the majority at that time in the House, and he was just a, a really good old boy, but he's a really nice person. Um, and uh, so he managed to, to win enough. Um, and I, when Ralph Wright was first elected speaker, the Republicans still had the majority. Um, and that would have been 85. And so sometime after that, we're beginning to see the House became Democratic majority. The Senate even lagged behind that. Um, so these were very Republican bodies until pretty recent in our time, if you think of the hundred years that we were the most Republican state in the nation. Um, so I think that has something as well to do with the composition of the legislature in those times. I think it'll be uh, really interesting to watch the results of this, of this, uh, of the, the election on the local level in the next two weeks. Uh, there are now uh, groups in Vermont I can think of one, Emerge Vermont, which has been very active and strong in seeking out uh, women uh, candidates and of both parties. And they, there are a number of them running in, in the elections in two weeks. So I think there'll be even a stronger representation at the end. Yes, ma'am? This is a loaded question. I'm an archivist. As you were sitting here doing your job as reporters, thinking, watching history being made, what kind of urge, if ever, did you have to go back to the history of the state, to go to the state archives and check the historical records to see what this debate looked like 20 years earlier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So, um uh, we had the great luxury of having Gregory Sanford as the archivist in that period. So we had nothing, we couldn't help but be reminded of all of the past debates. His columns that he would write about, um, you know, what we're seeing today happened in 1927, 1854 and everything were really remarkable. But I think for some of us, uh, we did that even without Gregory's help. You know, when the, when the um, state Supreme Court um, said that the state system of financing education was unconstitutional, um, they were saying something that every governor for 100 years had been saying. And legislators knew it too and when we've been reporting those stories we would remind people of what governors had said whether it was Dean Davis or even a hundred years ago that the state system of financing education was inequitable um, so we were able to use those history language lessons in those but what you find in the, in situations like that when you can throw as much history as you want at things that there's a reason that some of these issues had not been solved in those hundred years. They're tough decisions, and we even see, that. so when, when Act 60 passed, it was the beginning of the Take Back Vermont movement, which then got a lot more aggravated after civil union, which came, the state Supreme Court order came in 1999. And so what's interesting about that, this is an aside, it's not um, part of your question, but some of the most difficult decisions that the legislature has had that made in my tenure were forced upon them by the state Supreme Court. 
And in each of those cases, the state Supreme Court re relied almost extensively on the historic record or the common cause, the uh, common benefits clause of the state constitution. I would also add that one of the interesting things I mentioned it earlier is that there is a uh, procedure in this house and in, in the other body to explain your vote. And you can go back in the house journals, uh, Senate journals, and read people's discussion about why they voted. And um, I mentioned Frank Hutchins when I did the book with two other colleagues on, on Governor Hoff. Well, actually, his whole speech is in the House that's been, quote, journalized in the House uh, Journal of that day. And it, is, it makes history very live and very real. I can't resist that question. Uh, I have to say that we were so busy when we worked here in Montpelier. I mean, literally, Steve, doing five, six stories a night, and, and I'm talking three, four, five, six, seven typewritten pages each. And then uh, you listed the votes at the bottom of the story. You had to type everybody's name, uh, who voted one way or another, and that took, you know, an hour probably. Uh, we didn't have much time to go out and research, but uh, I've spent an awful lot of time researching over there. And, uh, you know, this remarkable place we're in here, you know, you probably do, but uh, you know that uh, on the 9th of May, 1865, in this room, in these seats under this uh, uh, great chandelier, uh, the legislature voted 247 to nothing to outlaw slavery to ratify the 13th Amendment. Wow. With that, I want to thank Chris Graff, Howard Coffin, Candy Page, and all of you. This has been a lot of fun. We are at the end of our day of exploration of uh, issues around journalism and since the uh, panel spoke several times about the reapportionment issue I have to share a couple of reapportionment stories of my own and I'll be short when the when the house I was standing I, I came down from the crow's nest when the final vote was taken on reapportionment and I was standing right behind Phil Hawk when he let out his whoop and holler and went down the stairs and after they took uh, reapportioned, they had 246 desks in here. They had to take all the old desks out. My grandfather, Homer Kennedy, was a uh, representative from the town of Duxbury. So I went back to the old seating charts and I found the number of the desk that he sat at. And I went and looked at that desk and there, carved into the top of the desk, probably after many long hours of boredom, were the initials H.K., <laughs> Homer Kennedy. <laughs> minor vandalism from, uh, from a, uh, I have to say, a minor legislator. I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to, uh, I want to thank you uh, all for coming and um, I'm going to uh, thank the friends of the Vermont State House. I want to especially thank our committee and uh, the Vermont Humanities Council. I want to thank the Sergeant Arms Office, the Curator's Office, and the various monetary sponsors, the Abbey Group, the Community National Bank, WDEV, Chroma, Green Mountain Power, Rockingham Arts and Museum Program, BPR is our media partner, and uh, promotion help from the UVM Center for Research on Vermont and uh, WDEB for their live broadcast. And I see there's a the comment from the audience. Use your microphone, sir. Thank you, and I apologize for not raising my hand earlier uh, twofold. The comment I want to make is, is speaks to the question of in inclusion. And I would 
first of all, I thank you for this tremendous, tremendous historic moment. But the comment that I would make is that I hope you will look at inclusion for the next time that the experience of this sort takes place. And let me, if I may, if I may, just a little context, and again, I apologize, but just a little context. I've been here, my wife and I, over 30 some odd years, and as I look at the table here, and we heard the last people, uh, Chris, I've enjoyed the conversations we've had over the years. I'll never forget the conversations I've had with the uh, candidates and her mother, uh, Ruth Page, and uh, I appreciate Howard keeping history alive, but this house and this state is a stage that speaks to the crisis that we are in at this moment, external and also in our state. As you know, we had a legislator who suspended our re-election campaign because of the crisis issues which are facing us as a people. It is said that life and death are in the tongue. Well, life and death are also affected by what we see and who we see. People before Steve who have never met and people after Steve to this very day think that the only way for something to be right, it has to be white. The only way for something to be right, it has to be white. And we as a family are more than just black and white. There's a Native American who was here 12,000 years before we came here. Vermont has already always been in the forefront of making history of yesterday that <clears throat> Howard spoke to. And we are in the position right now where those same values of connectedness, of cooperation, of concern and caring are called upon. And it is our opportunity to step up and visually be seen making a difference, visually hear the difference that is being made day in and day out, to look the other way and feel that no one is of importance. Invisible man, uh, Ralph Ellison, as, unless you're white. That's wrong. Our children know that. And I just want to recommend that the choir, excuse me, not the choir, <laughs> recommend that the committee the next time around take a look at that as we continue to go forth and making a difference. Thank you. Good final words. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your concern.